order, there being 27 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Pratt, you have the call. Madam Deputy President, I now would like to move amendment number four. This amendment will stop the indexation of prior payments, and we know that many people have had a disappointing experience when they've been through the damaging process of applying, only to receive a tiny or non-existent settlement. The question is that the amendment four, as moved by Senator Pratt on sheet 1196, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that amendment four on sheet 1196 is moved by Senator Pratt um, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 26 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Pratt, you have the call. I move Amendment 5 to make sure that there's, if there's any doubt about whether a prior payment relates to sexual abuse, uh, it, it shows that the scheme should err on the side of the applicant and not deduct payments from redress. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 5 on sheet 1196 is moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
stop, lock the doors. So the question is that Amendment 5 on sheet 1196 is moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 26 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Pratt, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Unless any senator wants to change their vote from the last amendment, I will put 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 together now. It's my understanding that the pattern of votes will remain the same, and so um, I put those questions. Thank and you. Are you seeking leave to move them together? Is leave yes. granted? Leave is granted. So the question is that amendments six to ten on double one on sheet double one nine six is moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that amendments six to ten on sheet double one nine six is moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davy as teller for the noes.
order, there being 26 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. So the question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. <coughs> the committee has considered the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Technical Amendments Bill of 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. The report of the committee be adopted. So the question is the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. I believe that the Senate now stands adjourned and I call Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It is often said that the past teaches us about the present, in that history gives us the tools to analyse what has gone before. Tonight I rise to highlight two significant Tasmanians. Senators, could you please leave the chamber in an orderly fashion? Sorry, Senator Askew. Thank you. Both, both of these significant Tasmanians are outstanding political leaders and both of whom positively impacted our nation during critical stages of our state and nation's history. In a way, I suppose you could describe them as one of the original power couples, Joseph and Enid Lyons. Joseph is Tasmania's only Prime Minister to date, but hopefully not the last, and Dame Enid was the first woman elected to the House of Representatives and to serve in Federal Cabinet. As Tasmanian Premier between 1923 and 1928, and then Prime Minister from 1932 until his death in 1939, Joseph Lyons, or Joe, is arguably Tasmania's most successful politician. Known as Honest Joe, his personal popularity was an influencing factor in the governments he led. In a political career that spanned three decades, Joe served in the Tasmanian Parliament during World War I and Federal Parliament during the Great Depression in the 1930s. As Prime Minister, Joe oversaw the rebuilding of the Australian economy after the Great Depression and established the Commonwealth Grants Commission. He pursued independent foreign policies, reducing Australia's reliance on Britain, and oversaw the creation of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in 1932. Joe was also Prime Minister during Edward VIII's abdication. While he began his, his political career in the Australian Labor Party, Joe later became the founding leader of the United Australia Party, the UAP, which later became the Liberal Party. Joe had a steady hand when it came to managing the country's finances. He followed the trusted principles of low inflation, reducing government debt, balancing the budget and repaying loans. These are principles we should and do still aspire to today. Born at Stanley in the northwest of Tasmania in 1879, Joe was the fifth of Michael and Ellen Lyons' eight children. Ellen was born in County Kildare, Ireland, and arrived in Australia in 1857, while Michael was born in Tasmania to Irish immigrants. After attending government and Catholic schools in Olverston and Stanley, Joe started working as a pupil teacher at Stanley State School when he was 15. As a qualified teacher, he was posted around the state between 1901 and 1907 before attending the Hobart Teachers College when it first opened. Joe then taught at the Glen Jew and Wellington Square State Schools in Launceston and was acting headmaster at Perth School. It is said his complaints about poor working conditions for teachers and his growing involvement in politics led to conflict with the Education Department. Joe resigned his teaching position to stand as a Labor Party candidate at the 1909 Tasmanian state election. He won a, state, a seat in the House of Assembly representing the North West electorate of Wilmot and re returned comfortably in 1912. He also began courting Enid Burnell in 1912. The couple married at Wynyard three years later when Joe was 35 and Enid was almost 18 years old. At that time, Joe was a minister in John Earle's Tasmanian Labor government.
When Labor had come to power in Tasmania in 1914, on the eve of World War I, Joe was made Treasurer, Minister for Education and Minister for Railways. However, Labor lost the 1916 state election and John Earle, a conscription supporter, resigned. Anti-conscriptionist Joe Lyons took over the party leadership and became the opposition leader. Joe led the party until 1923 when he became Premier, leading a minority Labor government for the next five years. He was also Treasurer throughout his Premiership, successfully reforming the powers of the Conservative Legislative Council to reject money bills after a constitutional crisis in 1924. Labor lost the 1928 state election by a narrow margin, which proved a catalyst for change for the Lyons family. Joe decided to run for the federal seat of Wilmot in the 1929 election. He was elected easily and appointed Postmaster General and Minister for Works and Railways. When the Great Depression hit in 1930, Joe's conservative approach was supported by the business community but opposed by many in the Labor Party. He resigned from Cabinet in January 1931 and in March, Joe and five other right-wing Labor MPs crossed the floor to sit on the opposition benches. Joe and his supporters joined members of the Nationalist and Australian parties and formed the new United Australia Party, the UAP. He was elected leader, thus becoming the opposition leader. After successfully moving a no-confidence motion in the Scullin government, Joe led the UAP to victory in the December 1931 federal election. At the 1934 election, the UAP suffered an eight-seat swing against it, so Joe invited the Country Party, now National Party, to create a coalition and form government. The Lyons government went on to win a third term in 1937 against the John Curtin-led Labor Party. While still in office, Joe died in Sydney on the 7th of April 1939 following a heart attack. His body lay in state at St Mary's Cathedral before being transported to Devonport for his funeral at the Church of Our Lady of Lords on the 13th of April. Less than a week later, Robert Menzies won the ballot for the UAP leadership later becoming Australia's longest serving Prime Minister. In 1943, Joe's widow, Enid, embarked on her own political career, representing the UAP in the Tasmanian seat of Darwin, which was later renamed Braddon. As the first woman to enter Australia's parliament, Enid Lyons is an inspiration to many women here, and I referenced, referenced her career in my first speech in this place. With a strong belief in tra traditional family values and conservative politics, Enid shared her husband's political views and campaigned for him. However, her involvement in community affairs and politics had begun long before she met Joe. It started via her mother's involvement with the Labor Party and continued throughout her life. Born in Smithton in 1897, Enid was the second child of four for sawmill worker William Burnell and his wife Eliza. Enid attended Burnie State School, followed by Hobart's Teachers College. She returned to Burnie as a junior teacher and struck up a friendship with fellow teacher and aspiring politician, Joe Lyons. Interestingly, Enid first stood for election for the state seat of Denison in 1925. The election campaign ran during a whooping cough epidemic which affected five of the Lyons children. Enid came within 60 votes of becoming the first woman elected to the Tasmanian parliament that, interest, that year. Interestingly, Margaret McIntyre took that accolade when she won Cornwall, now Rosevears, in the Legislative Council in 1948, 23 years later. When Joe became leader of UAP and then Prime Minister in 1933, Enid embraced the public spotlight and became involved in national politics. The couple and the 11 surviving of their 12 children moved into the lodge in Canberra. Enid spoke at political and community events, taking a stand against military conflict while stressing the importance of being prepared for war in Europe. She accompanied Joe on two official visits to England and was made a Dame Grand Cross of the Order of British Empire in 1937. After Joe's death in 1939, grief-stricken Dame Enid returned to Tasmania with her children, re-entering public life to run in the 1943 election. In her maiden speech on the 29th of September that year, Dame Enid spoke on social issues and the need for a post-war economic recovery plan. During her first term, she championed the extension of child endowment, free medical treatment for pensioners and the free distribution of life-saving drugs. Dame Enid increased her personal vote at two subsequent federal elections, keeping a clear focus 
on family values and national issues such as atomic energy, finance, population, industry, arbitration, social services, immigration and international affairs. In December 1949, Dame Enid was appointed Vice President of the Executive Council in Robert Menzies' Cabinet. Despite this role making her the first woman in federal cabinet, Dame Enid described the position as toothless, later writing, they only wanted me to pour the tea. Dame Enid resigned from federal parliament in 1951 due to ill health, but resumed public life later after a time of recovery at Devonport. She served as a commissioner of the ABC for 11 years, but also worked for the Australian Women's National League, the Victoria League, the Housewives Association and St John's Social and Political Alliance. She was made an honorary fellow of the Australian College of Nursing in 1951 and was founding vice president of the, of the Australian Elizabethan Theatre Trust in 1954. Extending her public reach, Dame Enid wrote three books on her life and political career, as well as penning a newspaper column twice a week. On Australia Day 1983, Dame Enid Lyons was made a Dame of the Order of Australia, making her the first Australian woman to receive damehoods in two different orders. Dame Enid died the following year, aged 84 years, and was buried beside Joe at Devonport after a state funeral. As you can see from their story, Joe and Enid Lyons were both strong leaders. Their strong values and commitment to their family, their state right. and their nation Your were order. evident throughout their lives. Thank you. Senator Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to speak about a couple of issues this evening. Um, the first issue is about uh, a bloke who I've got to know really well who lives just outside Rockhampton, Chad Stokes. Uh, Chad is married with three children and he's been working as a coal miner in central Queensland coal mines for about seven years. And that whole length of, of time that Ch Chad has been working as a coal miner, he's been classed by various different companies as a casual or what's known locally as a permanent casual. Um, in what has to be one of the silliest phrases I've ever heard in a workplace setting. Chad, over that period of seven years, uh, has worked most of the time pretty consistently, uh, working the same shifts week after week, month after month, year after year. In fact, if you looked at how often Chad has worked and the kind of work that he does, you'd actually say that he's a permanent worker. He works basically the same shifts all the time, uh, he wears the same uniform as the permanent workers that he works with, but because of the loophole that currently exists in our workplace laws uh, that this government and big mining companies have exploited, uh, Chad is nevertheless classed as a casual worker. And what that means in practice is that for seven years, Chad and other workers like him has not had a single day's paid sick leave has not had a single day's annual leave. By seven years working as a permanent, he'd be starting to become entitled to take some long service leave, but he doesn't get that either. He doesn't get any redundancy pay every time uh, his work finishes and he's laid off. Uh, he doesn't get any notice any time that he's laid off from work. And of course, he doesn't have the job security that the permanent peak workers that he works alongside get. And what that means is that he and his family have a constant level of stress about how long he's going to remain in work, how long he's going to have a paycheck, how long he's going to be able to keep feeding his family. Uh, workers like Chad, because they're not treated as permanent workers and they're treated instead as casuals, can't get home loans, can't get co car loans. It leaves them in a very insecure, precarious place. And unfortunately, Chad is not alone. I've met many coal miners across central Queensland who are in exactly the same position. And in fact, if we look across the country, there are thousands of coal miners now working as so-called permanent casuals. Now, it's often said that it's OK because people like Chad, they get compensated with a casual loading. And that's what covers the fact that they don't get these leave benefits and the job security that permanents get. But that's actually not true. A recent study by the McKell Foundation established that many coal miners uh, who are employed as so-called permanent casuals in fact are being paid 30 or 40 per cent less than the permanent workers they work alongside, as well as missing out on the job security, leave benefits and other benefits that permanent workers get. 
So let's not have any of this notion uh, that casuals are fairly compensated for the lack of security in their work. They have the double whammy of getting paid less than permanent workers and also missing out on the benefits of permanent work. And it's, it's such a betrayal of these workers by members of the LNP who sit in this chamber and in the House of Representatives who are out there day after day saying how much they care about coal miners, dressing up like coal miners, paying visits to coal mines and telling workers there how much they care for them and how much they're working hard for them. When they come down to Canberra, they've done nothing to fix this problem and they have had ample time to do so. Because it occurred to me that just as Chad has worked as a so-called permanent casual coal miner for seven years, that's exactly the same length of time uh, that the member for Capricornia, Michelle Landry, the member for Dawson, George Christensen, Senator Canavan and all of the other so-called supporters of coal miners have been sitting in this parliament and have failed to take any action to assist Chad and his fellow casual workmates. These LNP members who say how much they like mining and say how much they like miners have been here for every bit as long as these coal miners have been classed as casual workers. And those LNP members have done not a thing to fix the rampant casualisation and abuse of labour hire that we have seen across the mining industry in central Queensland. And of course, it's not just happening in the mining industry. That's, of course, a particularly blatant example of it. It's happening in so many different industries, whether it be construction, security, cleaning, manufacturing. In fact, one of my clearest memories from the last term of parliament was a particular day where I spent the day in Rockhampton speaking with coal miners who were suffering from this exploitation and this lengthy casualisation. And that evening I returned to Brisbane to do a forum with Commonwealth public servants. And you know what the biggest complaint they had was? It was the abuse of labour hire and casualisation by this very government in terms of how it engages its own staff. So this is something that is spreading right throughout the economy, throughout many, many different industries. This growth of insecure work, whether it be through casual work, contract work, labour hire, gig work, all sorts of categories of work um, that these days are missing out on the benefits of permanent work and not being fairly compensated for it. And it's because this has become such a big problem uh, that last week the Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, had some good news for these workers, because we are clearly on the side of workers experiencing insecure employment. And the best example of that was the policy that was released last week with a very simple title, same job, same pay. If you're working on a regular, systematic basis, working the same shifts week after week, month after month, like Chad and the other coal miners that I've met or the public servants that I've met or the construction workers that I've met who are going through this, if you're working uh, as you know, on that sort of regular basis through labour hire, then you will need to be paid at least the same as the permanent workers that you work alongside. That's what a federal Labor government will do, because we're on your side. Of course, there are a range of other announcements that were made by Mr Albanese in that speech as well, which would also have great benefit to the vast number of people who are now experiencing insecure work, uh, and I think that they will make a very big difference to people's lives. Uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on before my time runs out uh, is the latest, latest version of rorts uh, that we have seen from a government that is truly riddled with rorts. And what I'm talking about is bushfire rorts. We've already seen from this government sports rorts. We've seen sleazy land deals. We've now seen rorting of community safety funding. And now it appears that not even bushfire victims are safe from the rorting that is endemic within this government. Because clear evidence has now emerged uh, that, this, that the Morrison government is partnering with their coalition allies in the New South Wales government to shovel bushfire funds on a partisan basis towards coalition seats or highly marginal independent seats that are being targeted by the coalition at the expense of Labor seats. And I'll give you one example of that. Two of the worst affected areas after the Black Summer bushfires were the Blue Mountains outside Sydney and the Snowy Valleys region west of Canberra. 
Both experienced terrible bushfires, terrible damage, uh, terrible losses. And in fact, the National Bushfire Recovery Agency within this government paid $136,000 to a report prepared by long-term Liberal mate Peter Crone uh, to inform decisions about which regions had suffered the most damage and which regions needed most assistance in the form of economic recovery grants. Now, Mr Crone's report established that both the Blue Mountains and the Snowy Valleys region had both experienced around a 48 per cent economic loss. So on that basis, you would think that both of those regions would qualify for roughly the same amount of funding when it came to local economic recovery funds. But no, that didn't happen, because the Snowy Valleys region is based in a seat that was held for a long time by disgraced Liberal MP Darrell Maguire, the seat of Wagga Wagga, is now marginally held by an independent MP. But of course, the coalition in New South Wales want to win it back. So that seat got 12 grants at a total value of $33 million. And just up the road in the Blue Mountains, in a seat held by the Labor Party, how many grants did they get? Not one. Not one. Not a single dollar. It is a scandal, Senator Farrell. And that's another example of the terrible behaviour and terrible rorting that is endemic in this government. How you vote should not determine the support you get from your government after a bushfire. Order. You should just get your what you time need. Time has expired, Senator Seward. The acting deputy president. Tonight I rise to speak on the future of the job seeker payment, which is due to go back to just $40 a day in the very near future. In fact, in just 44 days, the job seeker corona virus supplement or COVID supplement will end, condemning over one million people on the JobSeeker payment to live on just $40 a day. The COVID supplement, first introduced at the rate of $550 a fortnight in March last year in the face of the COVID pandemic, transformed people's lives and lifted millions out of poverty. It was the first time the unemployment payment was at a rate above the poverty line for decades. The supplement enabled people on the job seeker payment, youth allowance and parenting payment to be able to afford nutritious food, to improve their well-being, three meals a day, school children's, fun school children's activities, buy essential medications, pay housing, co housing costs. Some people got new clothes and shoes, which would enable them to participate in interviews with confidence pay for heating and cooling. By introducing the supplement at that extra rate of $500, $550 a fortnight in March, the government finally, finally acknowledged what everybody else knew, that $40 a day, trying to survive on it, was simply impossible. It was impossible to survive on that amount of money. Although the government is now winding it back, they know that $40 a day is too low. When the government finally recognised that $40 a day was not enough in March, they knew, as I said, that $40 a day was not enough. But they can't stop their ideological campaign of stigmatising people who access the social security net. While thousands were and still continue to access the social security people, net, many of these people accessing our social security service is the first time in their lives that they've had to do that. This government just cannot, however, give up on its myth-making, its myth-spreading and attacking people on income support. They continue to air the old myths about people who are accessing our income support payments and invent excuses to excuse after excuse as to why, despite being a wealthy country, we have one of the lower unemployment payments in the world. One of the government's favourite lines—and I've heard this, uh, lines and these lines and excuses being given by a number of, a number of ministers—is the really plain old propaganda line that the jobs are there and people just aren't looking for them. They're not trying hard enough. Now, the government may have an unusual take on these numbers, 
but the numbers show that there simply are not enough jobs there. Currently, there are around 1.3 million job seekers and only 129,000 vacancies advertised in January. That's not even counting the number of people who are currently on JobKeeper who are working no hours and who may lose their job when the program ends at the end of March, a couple of days before the end of the job seeker payment on the, on the 31st of March. Now, there's another old favourite, and that is an income support payment above the poverty line is a disincentive to finding work, when in fact there's clear evidence that the opposite is true. Living in poverty is a barrier to finding work. We know that people living on $40 a day cannot afford the basics, find it hard to keep a roof over their head, let alone transport to get to an interview or other necess necessary training work, um, to even afford an internet connection, to apply for the jobs and to participate online in the job seeking process, which is where the government is pushing so many people, or in fact afford to buy suitable clothes to attend a job interview. They can't afford their medication. They can't afford to go to the dentist. Labor market research shows that the increased level of job seeker has not impacted on the rates of people seeking employment or the time it takes for employers to fill job vacancies. The so-called anecdotal evidence given by some employers have been uh, has, have, has been attributed by economists to regular difficulties filling certain positions at certain times of years and particular difficulties with, with skill shortages and the requirement to relocate. People's lived experience should be understood by decision makers in government. The need to make sure that they meet their family commitments, their, that to make sure that they are meeting their caring commitments, that they have uh, support networks available, that they have accommodation, all are barriers to people uh, relocating. Our Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, also likes to tell us that the economy is recovering, so it's time to widen back support. While well, things are improving, and they are improving in some areas and for some people, but not for others, we are still in a pandemic and will be facing this situation for quite a long time, unfortunately. The government introduced tax cuts for millionaires, but now they're refusing to properly support the more than 1.3 million people who are out of work while this pandemic and recession continues. With the big banks ending mortgage holidays and the state-based eviction moratoriums lifting, thousands of Australians are also at risk of losing their roof over their heads or finding themselves unable to repay um, or to pay their rental debts, which have accumulated through no faults of their own. This is coming at the same time that JobKeeper is ending and the job seeker payment goes back to $40 a day. Not only do we have, I think, a moral and ethical responsibility to support job seekers and to ensure that they are not condemned to poverty and, in fact, are enabled to live above the poverty line, there are significant economic benefits to our broader community through supporting job seekers at an adequate payment level above the poverty line. What about that old line, the jobs that are available, why don't people pick fruit? I've heard that innumerable times, in fact too many times to count over the last couple of months. The government pushes the narrative of job snobs to further demonise people who access income support. This is casual, insecure work where there's often a lack of accommodation, where there's not the support available for people to move uh, in, the, in the areas that they move to. This is not a way that we treat those people that are looking for work. It is not the way that we should be encouraging people to be able to find employment, meaningful employment. We are asking that the government raises the job seeker payment above the poverty line. If they want people to relocate to the bush, they need to understand people's lived experience, not demonise them, not try to browbeat them. We are asking people, entire families, to uproot their lives for short-term 
job prospects in an industry that has notoriously low rates of pay and high rates of exploitation, and that continues despite, I will acknowledge, the best efforts or efforts, I should say, not necessarily the best efforts, but efforts by government to ensure that exploitation doesn't occur. But we hear time and time and again how that's occurring. Many job seekers are unable to keep up the cost of running a vehicle due to the low rates of income support payments. So that will be particularly the case when the payment goes back to $40 a day, making relocation to regional areas even harder, where there's a lack of rental accommodation and a lack of reliable public transport. Yes, we should be supporting job seekers on more than $40 a day. Many of the people in the job seeker payment, we know, are on job seeker payment because they can't get access to the disability support pension because of the changed rules. So there's a high proportion, nearly 40 per cent of people who are sick and have a disability trying to survive on the job seeker payment. That is never mentioned when the government talks about all those jobs that are available out there. There's all these job snobs out there. Well, there's not. There are people that are looking for work and need support to find work. Living on $40 a day, well below the poverty line, means going without food, going out with, without your medications, making it more difficult to find work, making work further and further out of reach increase permanently the job seeker rate so people aren't living in poverty. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And um, can I uh, acknowledge that you too were at the same event that I was at last Friday night when uh, the members of the South Australian uh, Liberal Party um, State Council uh, selected the four candidates that will be represented on our ticket at the next federal election. Uh, with two women and two men on our ticket, in addition uh, to their respective careers spanning agriculture, small business, resources, communication, law, economics, military and health, just to name a few. They understand what's important to everyday South Order. Australians. Senator they they are a diverse team that was greatly advanced by the selection of uh, my very good friend, Indigenous Order. woman Karen Little, who Senator is here Farrell, uh, as third interject. on the party's ticket as well as Dr Rachel Swift, a Rhodes Scholar who has worked in West Africa with the UN to combat the deadly uh, Ebola disease. Um, alongside uh, sitting senators, um, Simon Birmingham, a very leader in this place, and Andrew McLaughlin, who is in the chamber tonight. Andrew, who has, uh, is a graduate of the South Australian Parliament, where he was a president of the Legislative Council for a number of years before he graduated to become a member of this august body, our Senate. Um, so combined with Andrew and Simon, Karen and Rachel give us an amazing diversity, youth and experience balanced against what must be the most extraordinary depth of life experience that they all are able to bring to this place. But um, you know, Karen, as a proud Arunda woman, um, has seen firsthand the disadvantage in our remote communities and is comfortable with calling Senator out Farrell. paternalism and the hypocrisy that promotes low expectations. She still has the red dirt underneath her fingernails from country Australia and has a track record of delivering outcomes. She can break a brumby, she can mule a sheep, she scrubs oak and scrub up to present the evening news on Channel 7 or the ABC, and she can uh, negotiate multi-million dollar deals uh, behind land agreements. The Liberal Party is a party uh, of equal opportunity, and our Senate candidates harness the diverse experiences on business backgrounds that make that possible. We believe in the encouragement of the facilitation of wealth so that all may enjoy the highest possible standards of living, health, education and social justice. And each and every one of our candidates believe that they want the next generation to be better placed to succeed than in, their, in life than in their own. Our, our party is comprised of Australians from all walks and stages of their lives. Fighting for South Australia requires individuals who are prepared to stand up for bigger state cousins and prepared to stand up for the investment our state uh, needs, sometimes against a national trend. A diversity of experience uh, and insight into both public and private sector 
and a backgrounded knowledge and business acumen are critical Farrell, to the role Danny of senators. With real-world experience, the SA Senate ticket is a strong team who will advance South Australia's interests at the next federal election. You know. They share a vision for South Australia where we can attract more investment to ensure that the jobs in stay in our state, both in Adelaide and across all of our regions, to help keep our children working and living in South Australia. It is absolutely critical we put the right team in place to ensure strong representation for South Australia in Canberra and to campaign effectively for the re-election of a Morrison-McCormack uh, government, which is so essential to ensure the stability of Australia's economy going forward. I look forward to working with Simon Birmingham, with Andrew McLaughlin, with Karen and with Rachel Swift, with David Fawcett and Alex Antich to make sure that we do re-elect a Morrison McCormack government because we know that Australia relies on us to, to deliver the right government to make sure that our society and our economy goes forward in leaps and bounds. And we will work tirelessly to make sure that we secure the greatest number of Liberals to represent our state. And in closing, Mr President, I'd also like to acknowledge two outstanding young women who were pre-selected on the weekend to uh, take up hopefully their seats in the state parliament at the next election in South Australia. Ashton Hearn, who was pre-selected in the seat of Schubert, um, who worked for me, I'm very proud to say, is the most outstanding young woman who will make an incredible contribution uh, to South Australia. Uh, she is Senator an Farrell. extraordinary um, young lady, and uh, I think uh, Senator Farrell, opposite, with his interjections, would do well to watch her progress because, Senator Farrell, I can assure you, you will see um, Ashton Hearn become a great great South Australian politician and make sure that she supports the continued Liberal government in South Australia to make sure that your team don't get their hands on the Treasury benches and cause the kind of devastation they did last time they had control. The other person who was pre-selected on the weekend was Amy Williams, who was pre-selected for the seat of Mawson. Um, Amy is, uh, comes from the country. Uh, she has a great dairy farming background. And she's no stranger to agri-politics. Um, between those two wonderful young women, as well as the great team that Stephen Marshall has already start, formed around him, and others that hopefully will be uh, pre-selected over the coming weeks to fill the team uh, vacancies in South Australia, that we will be able to deliver the great diversity that Australia and South Australia needs to make sure that we continue to govern this country for the best outcomes for all of the citizens of Australia and South Australia. I'm very proud, Mr Acting Deputy President, to be here tonight to tell you about the amazing people that the South Australian Liberal Party is putting in our parliaments, both here in Canberra and in South Australia, to make sure that we have got the kind of diversity that the other side continually lack. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I do just remind you to address senators in this place by their correct title. And Senator Farrell, I do remind you that you have been breaching Standing Order 203 by consistently and willfully uh, not complying with Standing Order 197. The Senate now stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.